We're living into the promises of Jesus, promises he made, some 200 different promises to help us become more like him, to get out of this world alive. And today we're continuing this theme of the idea of worship with looking at seeing the unseen. Jesus made a promise. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. Seeing the unseen. You see that? From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Hmm. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? After, even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Isn't that why we emphasize Jesus? Isn't that why we sing songs about Jesus? Isn't that why we pray through his name and study his life? Because he is the revelation of the unseen being who is our creator, who is our sovereign, who is our sustainer, who is the giver of every good and perfect gift. One little kid was scared one night and the parents came in for the third or fourth time and said, don't be afraid, don't you know God is with you? And the little child said, yeah, but I need somebody with skin on them. <laughs> we need some visible, and the Lord knew this, it was his plan all along before he ever created man, knowing that we would sin. It was decided before the world was created that Jesus would come. Now you think about that. God said, let us make man in our own image. And so in the Convenient, uh, the convening of that heavenly conference, you have all of these angels, but of course you have the Word, which became flesh, Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit, and you have God the Father. And they are discussing this, and they say, let us make man in our own image. They had to know, and they did indeed know, that the first man and woman they made would sin, and that that would necessitate a sacrifice a sacrifice of one of them. Isn't that the love of God that knowing it would cost the life of Jesus in the flesh, he in the spirit created us. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And the plan always was to have that full revelation, that, that mystery unraveled about what this whole world is about. And it came about when Jesus was born in Bethlehem lived out a life in the flesh, God in the flesh, the incarnation, giving his life upon the cross for us. And that's why we sing about Jesus. That's why we pray to him. That's why we emphasize a relationship with him, being closer to him every day with him, he being our teacher. Right now, you may sit here and you may have no sensation of motion. Just like this still frame of North America. It just looks like it's still. But you know it's spinning. And we are spinning at a thousand RPMs. That is, we're spinning at a thousand miles an hour. That's why every day in 24 hours it spins around one time. I know that's simple. You knew that. And we are traveling at the same time we are spinning at 68,000 miles an hour around the sun. Isn't that wild? And not only that, we're traveling 1.6 million miles every day at a speed of 18 miles every second. Turn to the person next to you and say, no wonder you're tired. But physics is really all about the unseen. The laws of physics have been extrapolated by mathematics and by observation and satellites and infrared um, I, I was amazed the first time I ever realized that the star I'm looking at isn't there anymore. That light left that position a long time ago and that star has moved on as the whole universe is going out from a central point of origin. We're looking at a bended light and that light is coming from where it was when it sent it. I don't hope that doesn't ruin anything for you. I just wonder what it would look like if I could see where it is now and what things are really like. But physics is really about understanding that which we cannot see. You can't see gravity, but jump off the building, it'll work. And in the spiritual realm, we can't see love, but we can see the fruit of love, the action of love. Faith is really all about unseen things. I mean, I go to a doctor whose name I can't spell. He gives me a drug I can't pronounce. I go to someone, well, I know our pharmacist, but if you go to some pharmacist you don't know and you go home and you pop that pill. That's faith, isn't it? 
A lot of unseen things going on there. Hebrews chapter 11, 1 talks about this. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith. You know, there are varying degrees of how certain we are about things in which we put our faith. Can a smart person believe in God? Michael Gillen asked that question in the book of that title. And he said there are only two kinds of people. Those who believe in God and those who believe in something else. Isn't that the case? It's not my purpose today to prove the existence of God. He's already proven it. It's, I guess it's my purpose to help us, help me, see more clearly that which is not visible. And of course we know that this comes through a connection with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one who can connect us with God. Jesus came to connect us with the unseen. In uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, it had always been true since the world was created that people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see him, his invisible qualities. And there are a couple listed here. His eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Even though God is unseen, there are things which he has made that manifest a certain creative power that is beyond the genius and ability of man to do, certainly, or even to explain. And from that we see that there is God, a creator God of power. We also see that he is a God of certain characteristics. We can see certain order. There are certain things of provision that we see in nature as we look at it, the balance of the ecosystem. Now man, like sin, uh, in the spiritual realm, does everything we can to destroy God's physical realm. But when he created it, it was very good. And we know how good it is. But Jesus comes into this world to let us know more than God's power and a few divine qualities that we can ascertain from nature. And he becomes flesh. In the beginning was the word, John 1.1. 1, 1. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And it goes on to say, all things were made through him, that is the word, and without Jesus nothing was made that was made. Now no one has ever seen God. You can't see God and live, the Bible says, not in his true nature and glory. But God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And then in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God's creation tells us certain things. He's invisible, but this visibility begins to unravel for us. And then Jesus comes and says, here it is. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Speaking of Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of every creation. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him, that is Jesus, and for him, that is Jesus. You see, Jesus is that point at which all things began for us. God has no beginning. But all things began for us as human beings. And he is that point to which all of history is heading. And when he came into this world, he is, came to reveal the truth of all of this. To reveal the invisible nature. Who is this God? For years, many people thought when it thundered, it's an angry God. When lightning happened, God's flashing his anger. You know, when anything bad happened, oh, God is angry. Someone asked me this week, if you can believe it, it's a question that I've never been asked before. Have you read Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? Well, I have, but it was, what, 1700s when it was written. I, I didn't hear it, personally, but I have read it. And in it, it, he pictures God as an angry God. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Well, from nature, you could get that way. I mean, if, if a flood can come and wash you away, well, it still can. And we might still think, you know, who is this God? Some people say, I won't serve a God that allows a world in which evil happens. But yet they want to have the freedom to do wrong. And when we do wrong, the Bible says in the very beginning in Genesis that God cursed the earth because of sin. That's the bad news. We wouldn't have done any better. But he sends Jesus in order to cure these ills. He is the image of the invisible God. When you look at Jesus, when you study the life of Jesus, you are seeing who God really is. That's quite a picture. And I challenge you to find something wrong with who God really is. 
in the life of Jesus. You cannot do it. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, though, that there is a God of this age as well. Some know him as the devil. He has blinded the minds of unbelievers. I mean, they're blind to God's power in creation. They're blind to the divine nature in creation. And they're blind to the revelation of the express image of the invisible in Jesus. And he has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Not only unbelievers have a problem with this, but I have a problem with this. Because I'm sure that the God of this world has blinded me many times and seeks to blind me. He seeks to say, look at what this world offers. Weren't those the temptations of Jesus? You know, here, here have this. Here, enjoy this. Fall down and worship me and you can have the whole world. And Jesus says, no, no. You can't live by bread alone. No, you have to worship the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve. We shouldn't tempt the Lord God. No, he's always trying to blind my eyes by the things that I can see and want in the flesh from the things that are unseen. That's the challenge we face as we live before an unseen being. That's the challenge we face. And knowing that we would have this challenge, he sent Jesus to show us how to do that. And that's the wonderful thing about it. And so Paul would exclaim almost in song in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. But I don't always live like that, do you? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. I mean, you just can't get any better than Jesus. He represents God. He is God. He saved us on the cross. And now he intercedes for us in heaven. That's really what's going on. But it's unseen. But here's this thing I want. It's, a, it's not according to God. Here's this thing I think I need. It's not according to God. And maybe there's a lot of good things. I'll just get caught up in doing a lot of good things. Nothing wrong with them. But I will get so caught up in it that I will live as if that which is invisible does not exist at all. I'm not an atheist. But sometimes I live as if I am. In other words, sometimes I do things that if an atheist were beside me doing the same thing, it would be hard to tell who believes in the invisible and who doesn't. I'm a practicing atheist at that moment. Luckily, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can come back, I can repent, I can turn back. There's no place that you can get where the invisible God through Jesus is not reaching out to you. That's the teaching of Jesus. He's always looking out for us, isn't he? He's the shepherd who leaves the 99 and goes finds the one and brings him back. He's the one who's curing people, helping people, loving people, giving his life for people. That's God. Sometimes when we do wrong, let's say, I just better not hang around here for a little while. No, he's the very person he wants you to hang around him. Before Jesus, God was, I would say, now you see him, now you don't in the Old Testament. You know, you read through and things are real bad. And then all of a sudden God shows up to a prophet or a judge or some power. And there's a miracle. And, but here's what Isaiah said. Truly you are a God who hides himself. O oh God and Savior of Israel. This is not a lesson on why he chose to do that. I think free will and some other things probably enter into that. If God were to appear, we wouldn't be able to live. If he were to show his true glory, even though Jesus is the exact representation of his glory, he is not... God on, in the flesh, he was not the God who is exalted on the throne. No one could see him and live. But he comes in a human form and displays God to us as humanly possible as it is to do. God still hides. He does not force himself upon us. Do we see those things that are hidden? That's the challenge if we're going to worship the invisible instead of the things that are in this world which makes us idolaters. There's a passage of scripture in 2 Kings chapter 6. There is a war going on really between Israel and the king of Aram. And it seems like every time the king of Aram tries to trap Israel, Israel knows what's going on and they just can't be trapped. And so the king is getting upset about this. And the enraged king of Aram summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? In other words, how does he know everything we're planning? 
One of you guys is a traitor. And one of the generals says, none of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet, who's in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. I love that. The Lord knows what, everything we're doing. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. Isn't that stupid? Here's a guy that knows everything he says in his bedroom, and now he's saying out loud to a whole bunch of people, we're going to capture him. Uh, good luck with that. But that's how we live. We know God is invisible. We know he knows everything, sees everything. But sometimes we live as if he's on a slight vacation. Or at least we're going to go on one. I know I do. So I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. They got them now. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Wow. I can't help but think that's the way it is right now. Does not the Bible say that God's angels are ministering servants sent to minister to those of us who are heirs of the kingdom of heaven? Your guardian angels may be a little more busy than the next person's. You know, maybe it's our job to make their job a little easier, to be more like Jesus. But I have to believe that we are surrounded by the holy host of God. No more so than when we come here. And where two or three are gathered together, Jesus himself promises to be with us in a very special way. It was Jesus who said, when Peter wanted to fight, put up the sword. Don't you think I could call 12 legions of angels right now? And this would be over. You see, he saw the unseen, and he lived that way. We want to be more like Jesus. How can we see the unseen more clearly? Well, we know it's a matter of walking by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this. It says we walk by faith, not by sight. Things we see, temporary. Things that are unseen, permanent, eternal. How do we live this way? It is by our faith in the invisible God. It's a faith that Jesus made possible and made real for us and put skin on. And if we're going to be worshiping more worshipful of the unseeing God then we have to get closer to Jesus in John chapter 6 and verse 44 Jesus said no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him everyone who listens to the father and learns from him comes to me no one has seen the father except the one who is from God how do we do this well we have to realize Christianity is not a religion Religion is humans trying to work their way to God, but Christianity is God coming to men and women through a relationship with Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave. He draws. We think we may do a lot of things. We do very little. It is God who is working in you. It is the Holy Spirit who is working in you. One thing I think that could help us as we study the Old Testament in getting closer to Jesus would be to meditate or to muse from throughout our day on what Jesus has done, who he is, his nature, and in this bring the invisible being closer to visibility in our heart. More immediacy. Uh, David did this in Psalm 143 verses 5 and 6. He says, I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Notice he starts with remembering and meditating and he ends up worshiping. Psalm 145 and verse 5. I will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. Sometimes we just need to open our hearts in prayer, begin to speak what Jesus has done, meditate upon those things. We may do some fasting like they did in the Old Testament. Jesus said his disciples didn't fast, but that's because he was there. But he said there'd come a time he wouldn't be there. The indication is that we would be doing some fasting. I think we know very little about that. We can stay away from bad influences. That's taught throughout the scriptures. If, if we're going to be in relation with the invisible God and concentrate on, on what is real, then we have to remove evil influences from our life, and we all have work to do with that. We have to avoid uh, materialism. 
because the love of money and the covetousness associated with that can lead us away from God. We have to also, I think, recognize the fact that there is a God of this world who is working against us. And maybe what's going on, he is trying to blind us at that point. <coughs> Getting closer to Jesus, that's what it's really all about. He's the one who revealed God. We can also look at his word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that you may be complete, thoroughly equipped to every good work. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and teaching. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them. So that everyone can see your progress. Joshua 1 and verse 8. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. So that it may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. I don't know who of us is going to sneak into all our homes and replace the remote with the Bible. But we'd be obliged. Deuteronomy chapter 17. We're reminded that even a king, as exalted as he might be is not to forget who he is in meditating upon the word of God. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Taken from that of the priests who are Levites, it is to be with him, and he's to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and do not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time. You know what? Sometimes we think that we've exalted ourselves in the Christian walk. We don't need that. The Bible says, I don't care if you're a king. You get down and copy that out so you've got your own Bible with you. Well, we don't have to do that. We have a Bible. But the message is the same, whether you're a preacher, elder, deacon, teacher, or just whatever we may be in the kingdom of God, a servant in, in this area, a counselor, whatever it is that we do, we're not to forget that we need attachment to the Word of God. Otherwise, the invisible things are begun, become less and less visible to us. And we need to speak by faith. I call that prayer. Because if, if there's nobody there, you're just talking in the air. But prayer is the key to heaven. And faith in somebody being there is what unlocks the door. You're not just saying some perfunctory thing that you're taught to say. You know, you're not just sick and you're praying to get well. You know there's someone there who has the power to heal you. You know there is someone there who has all power and all authority interceding for you. You know that the Holy Spirit within you is able to express those things that you cannot express. And this is real communication with the invisible being. First John chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. I write these things, John said, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of Him. And Jesus himself said in John chapter 16, In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. He was, going to, he was going to die, be placed in the grave, but he was going to ascend. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. In that day, you will ask in my name. In Jesus' name, amen. It's through Jesus that we have this connection with God. It is through his word that we are reminded of the true realities of this spiritual realm. And let's close with this thought. And this should describe each of us more and more. 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far, far outweighs them all. So... We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. I know many times we preachers say, this is my favorite passage, this is my favorite passage, and next week they get a new favorite passage. It's almost my pet peeve. So I try not to have a favorite passage. We should like all of them, but this one is one of my favorite passages. What is seen is is temporary. Look around. What is unseen is eternal. 
Jesus came to reveal that to us, and that's why we praise him. That's why we have a hope of eternal life.